The cross is God's love for you through His Son, Jesus Christ, dear friends. Jesus paid the ultimate price for our redemption. What does He desire from you in return? I extend a warm welcome to you, dear brothers and sisters, as you join me on another episode of Through the Bible series. Our last study was on the repetition and interpretation of the Ten Commandments to the new generation after the total decimation of the older generation in the 40 years of wilderness march. The emphasis is still on love and obedience as Moses probably sat down on a little higher ground and recalled. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt make no idols. And went on till thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, and thou shalt not covet. We conclude in our previous lesson that all these laws were conditions for God's blessing for the land and the people, but the Israelites could not keep them. Just as they were unable to keep them all, so are we in no better state. Now it was in this situation that the law pointed to Jesus, who is our Savior. So without further delays, I welcome you again, dear brothers and sisters, even as you join me on another session of our Bible study. Now let's continue our study. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6. As we have noted before, in the book of Deuteronomy, there has been an emphasis on two words. You remember? Love and obedience not law and obedience, as we may have supposed. God's love is actually expressed in law. The great principle of law is love. Therefore, the principle of the gospel itself is expressed in Deuteronomy. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. John chapter 3, verse 16. You and I express our love for God in our obedience. The Lord Jesus put it like this, If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14 verse 15 This is still the acid test today. If we love him, we will keep his commands. Salvation is something about love. 1 John chapter 4 verse 19 says, We love him because he first loved us. The Lord Jesus cited this as the greatest command of all. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That is Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. Our obedience is the manifestation of our love. Obedience is the important thing all the way through. It is if they keep these commands. Now you may wonder what is new about love in the New Testament if love is in the Old Testament. The difference is that in the New Testament the love of God has been translated into history by the incarnation and death of Christ. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were still sinners Christ died for us. He died for us. You see it is one thing to express love by bringing people out of Egypt. Well but it's another thing to die for them. It is one thing to say something from the top of Mount Sinai. It is another thing to come down and take our frail humanity upon himself, to be made in the likeness of man and to die on a cross for our sins. I repeat, salvation is a love relationship. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. 1 John chapter 4 verse 10 We are still in the second oration of Moses in chapters 5 to 7. He is giving a repetition and interpretation of the Ten Commandments. The Great Commandment, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 1 and 2. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God 
as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. The emphasis, you can see, is obedience. There are actually only two classes of people in the world, those who love God and those who hate God. The heart attitude of people is evidenced by their obedience or disobedience. Listen to Deuteronomy 5 verse 29. Oh, that there is such an heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Verse 3 again of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. They had promised to keep all the commandments of the Lord, and yet they fell so short, as we still do today. Now we come to a statement which is considered by many to be the greatest doctrinal statement in the entire scripture. Now listen carefully to verse 4 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That is a tremendous statement, the Lord, translated in English as Jehovah, God, is this translation for Elohim, the Lord our God. God is the translation for Elohim. Elohim is a plural word. Since there is no number given with it, one can assume the number is three. In the Hebrew language, a noun is singular, dual, or plural. When it is plural, but no number is given, one can assume it to be three. Isn't that interesting? This is therefore a reference to the Trinity. It could be translated, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah, our Trinity, is one Jehovah. Israel lived in a world where they worshipped many gods. The message that the nation Israel was to give to the world was the message of the unity of the Godhead, the oneness of the Godhead. Jehovah our Elohim is one Jehovah. Verse 5, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Our Lord Jesus quotes this as being the greatest commandment of all. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like this, namely, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is none other commandment, greater than these. How do you measure up to this? Many of us would have to confess that we do not measure up to this. We do not love him with all our mind and heart and soul. I must confess that I do not measure up to this. I do want to say that I love him. I wish I loved him more than I do, but he is the object of my affection today. I can truly say that I love him. That is what he asked Simon Peter. Do you love me? I think he would ask you and me that same question today. To learn to love him, we must sit at his feet and come to know him. He is the one altogether lovely. He is our God. Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you are that Christ, the Son of the living God. John 6 Verse 68 to 69. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He is our God. I worship Him. I want to know Him better. What does He mean to you? These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. This is Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. You remember that David said, Your, your word, word have I hid, I hid in mine, mine heart, heart that I might not, not sin, sin against you. you. Psalm 119, verse 11. That is the place where you and I should have the word of God today, my friend. It should be in our hearts. 
verse 7 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Paul says the same thing in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. And you fathers, provoke not your children to anger, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. God holds parents responsible to bring up their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. All through the scriptures, there is a great deal said concerning the responsibility of parents. Train, Train up a child, a child in the way he, he should, should go, go, and when, when he is, he is old, old, he will not will depart not from, from it. From Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6. That does not mean to train him in the way you want him to go. It means that God has a way for him to go and you are to align yourself or cooperate with God. That means, parent, you need to stay close to him. A lot of parents get totally shocked when their innocent little ones turn against them during their teenage years. What happened? Parents have basically reaped what they sowed. You sow the word, you reap good harvest. You've heard this, haven't you? Garbage in, garbage out. We are preoccupied making a living and have forgotten how to live. Leave alone teaching our young. The Lord gifts children and parents have the responsibility, remember, only for a certain time. After that, a child has the right to make his own choices and he can decide his own course. It is during those tender years that children long for human contact. They will beg you for stories. They'll cry if you're not around. If we don't capitalize on this dependence in their tender years, we would lose them forever starting from their teenage years when they desire independence. At that time, you can crave for some conversation for a hug or you may never get it simply because you were never there when they desired and craved for it during those early formative years. Dear parents, don't ever call time with children a sacrifice. It is an investment for eternity. Give spiritual input as much as possible, whenever, when you sit, stand, rise and sleep. When they are young, they will take it. These words were to be kept before them at all times. God wants His Word to be taught to His people just like that. It should greet them at every turn. Why? Because the human heart is prone to forget God and His ways. Well, what kind of literature is found in your house? When people walk in, do they find magazines and books which point you to the Savior? I do not mean to have your whole house splashed with scripture verses that the beauty of your single verses or statement is lost. No, all that I am saying is that when one can easily gauge the priorities of people by the literature, you've got to be careful on what is displayed. How about the conversations that you have? Is it always running another individual down? Or are there words of encouragement and hope? Then God warns His people that they should not forget Him after they get into the land and experience His blessings. It is a strange thing that when people are blessed, they tend to forget the one who blesses them. Verse 13 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Fear the Lord your God, serve Him only and take your oaths in His name. Our Lord Jesus used this verse when He was tempted by Satan. Do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massa. This is verse 16. This is another verse which our Lord used when he withstood the temptation of Satan. No wonder that Satan hates the book of Deuteronomy and levels his attacks against it. Again God admonishes his people to diligently do his commandments that they might keep the land he is giving to them and to explain this to their children also. Verse 23 But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land that He promised on oath to our forefathers. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. 
And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. God had brought them out of the land of Egypt. His purpose is to bring them into the promised land. It is just so with our salvation. God has saved us out of sin and death and judgment. He brings us into the body of Christ, into the place of blessing, into fellowship with himself, and finally into heaven itself. However, our salvation is still not complete. He was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Romans chapter 4 verse 25. He is our righteousness so that we might stand complete before him. He has brought us out. He intends to bring us in. Because of this, we can say today, I have been saved. We already have eternal life. We already stand before God in all the righteousness and merit of our Savior. And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. I have been saved. Do you have that assurance that you are saved? You should be able to say that I have been saved. You have the Son of God in your life. Secondly, you have to be able to say that I am being saved. God is working in my life, shaping, guiding, molding me to conform me more and more to his own dear Son. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do out of his good pleasure. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. This is not working for salvation, but it is the working out of salvation in our lives. I shall be saved is the third point. First, it was I am saved, I have been saved. Secondly, it was, I am being saved. And thirdly, it talks about, I shall be saved. Don't be discouraged with me, because God is not through with me yet. And I won't be discouraged with you, because God is not through with you either. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 A dear little lady got up in a testimony meeting and said that every Christian should have printed on his back a sign that reads, This is not the best that the grace of God can do. How true that is. God is not through with any one of us, but when he shall appear, we shall be like him. That's a wonderful thing to expect. Now let's turn to chapter 7 of Deuteronomy. Chapter 7 starts off with very strong language. To destroy, break, and to be separate. This was God's command to prevent the people of God from getting defiled by the polluting influence of evil. God gives Israel a solemn warning. If they do intermarry and turn to other gods, then God will put them out of the land. And yet... God makes it very clear to Israel that He is the God of love. He gives these commands because He loves them. Verse 6 of Deuteronomy chapter 7 For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be His people, His treasured possession. Verse 7 The Lord did not set His affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples, never a great nation in number. They would not compare to any other great nations of the world. Verse 8 But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh king of Egypt. You remember that God said in Exodus that he had heard their cry that distress cry. He responded because he loved them. He delivered them from bondage for that reason. He keeps repeating this. Verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, 
keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9 What is man's answer to the love of God? It is obedience. Verse 10, But those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate him. Verse 11, Therefore take care to follow the commands, decrees and laws I give you today. God will bless any people who respond to his love by obedience. Verse 12, If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your forefathers. He will love you and bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the crops of your land, your grain, new wine and oil, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks in the land that he swore to your forefathers to give you. Verses 12 and 13 of Deuteronomy chapter 7. How wonderful it would have been if Israel had believed God. God encourages them and he promises them victory. But do not be afraid of them. Remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. The faithfulness of God in the past should be an encouragement for them in the future. Isn't it precisely the same with us? Verse 21 Do not be terrified by them. For the Lord your God who is among you is a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will drive out those nations before you little by little. You will not be allowed to eliminate them all at once, or the wild animals will multiply around you. We see God's wisdom here. He is thinking of their safety, knowing that if the population were destroyed suddenly, the wild animals would take over the land. Dear friend, I hope you have learned the importance of putting God as your first love. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Love God first. Let that love occupy your mind, heart and strength. Only then will you experience a harvest of blessing. Yes, build and develop this love relationship with God. And remember, you need to destroy anything which would hinder or distance this love relationship. The law is good and it is a way we can express our love to God. Thank God for his enabling power. Through the spirit of God we can bless God and we can please God by our obedience. God has given us a huge responsibility to train our children in the ways of God and this can be done by our great and good examples. As we are tuned into him, let us continue to live this life so that the ones closest to us can experience God through our obedience to His Word. I hope you were blessed, dear friends. Today's lesson is a reminder to us to check our hearts with regards to the quotient of our love for God. We have seen that the call is to love God with everything. On God's part, it was not only giving us the law to prosper us, but to send Jesus, who paid the penalty for our deficiency in observing the same. And today, like the Israelites, we too are God's inheritance, set apart for Him alone. In this, our obedience to His commands alone can prove our love to Him. Meanwhile, take heart, dear friends, because Jesus loves you always. God bless you. Thank you.